Well, what's up, my family? Welcome to Thrive. Hope you're doing incredibly well. As always, I'm excited to have this opportunity to share with you principles from the most reliable source of information that exists in the world. That's the Bible. Watch this. Watch this. If you're like me, you're, you're probably in a season of your life where you want there to be some limitation of experimentation. <laughs> what does that mean? It means I don't have time to learn everything the hard way. And we believe the life that Jesus came to give when we follow, when we accept the person of his leadership and when we follow the principles that we taught, we believe it leads us to thriving. John 10, 10 says the thief comes to steal, kill and destroy. But Jesus said, I've come, but you might have life. One translation says more abundantly. The other says to the full. That's thriving. And that's what we're in pursuit of. That's what we're after. And I'm excited about all the time that we have to share together. Really quickly, if you have not subscribed to this channel or um, if you have not pressed that like button already, I want you to <laughs> I want you to do that. And the reason is uh, part of my mission is to help as many people as possible change their life. And I can't do that without your help. So I want you to help me help others. And uh, it's going to be, I think, an incredible day because when you press that like button, it helps push this video and this teaching into other people's feed. And uh, many of you tell me all the time, Dr. Darius, that's how I found out who you were. You just kept coming up in my feed. So I'm going to ask you to do that for us. All right. Well, listen, we teach in series here on Thrive. What does that mean? It means I take one particular subject and I spend a period of weeks unpacking, explaining, exploring that subject. And over these next few weeks, I want to, I want us to explore a, a subject that I think is so incredibly important, but really overlooked and often underemphasized. And, it, and it's a, watch this. We're going to do a series on spiritual gifts. It's called I'm gifted. Ooh, somebody just put that in the chat already. I'm gifted. I'm gifted. I'm gifted. Even if I'm not aware of how gifted I am, I'm gifted. Even if I'm underutilizing my gifts, I'm gifted. Even if others don't value my gifts, I'm gifted, even if I'm not confident in my ability to unleash my gifts. I'm gifted. I just want you to I want you to hear you say that I'm gifted. I'm gifted. I'm gifted. And the reason I want you to hear you say that is because I've taught you this and I'm gonna keep screaming it to the mountaintops. How far you go and how much you grow is not just determined by what you believe about God. It is equally impacted by what you believe about you. It, it's, it's not enough for God to know that you're gifted. It's not enough for others to know that you're gifted. It's not enough for God to know where you are gifted. It's not enough for others to know where you are, where you're gifted. It's equally important that you know that you are gifted and where you are gifted. And so we're going to explore this subject over the course of the next few weeks and I think, and I'm believing, this is going to add crazy value um, to your life. So I don't typically begin with the scripture, but I am today. Um, we, because we, I don't begin with the scripture typically because we're reading so much scripture throughout our lessons. But I want to read something in First Corinthians 12, verses one and two, and um, it's going to serve as a foundation and launching pad for us to leap into these series of lessons on this subject. So in first Corinthians, so this is the first letter that the apostle Paul writes to believers in Corinth, Corinthians, and uh, he's writing in response to some things that he's been made aware of that's transpiring in that Christian community. Now, this is what he says. Now he says in first Corinthians 12, Verses one and two, They're, we're going to give you a little more lower third support. So you're about to see this on the screen. This is what it says. It says, Paul says, now, now about the gifts of the spirit, meaning the first 11 chapters, he's been talking about to them about a number of different things. The verse chapter 12, verse one, he says, now about the gifts of the spirit, my brothers and sisters, he says, I don't want you to be uninformed. One translation says, I don't want you to be ignorant. 
Now, let me tell you why this is important, right? This is important not just because of what God says, but of what Paul says, but it's important because of who Paul says it to. He's saying this to Corinthians. Now, if you're not familiar with Corinth during this, during the period in human history where this particular epistle was written, I want you to imagine this. This is kind of like an oversimplification, but imagine this. I want you to imagine a place that's located where Miami is, that's populated like New York is, but operates like Vegas does. I'm going to say that one more time for your mind because <laughs> some, some of you missed that. Okay, is located where Miami is. This is an oversimplification, but I'm just trying to make a point. It's located where Miami is, populated like New York is, but then operates like Vegas does. That's the context of Corinth. So there were a number of different issues that they were dealing with. These is, this is a new Christian community. These are new believers. So there are a plethora of problems that Paul is helping them work through. I mean, there was some crazy stuff going on in Corinth. It was a lituation. It was just, it was ratchet. It was, it was on another level. So there's so much that Paul could and did talk to them about. But when he gets to chapter 12, he says, out of all the other things that I'm talking to you about, this subject right here is something I do not want you to be ignorant on either. And let me tell you why I believe that's important. Because many of us, let's be honest, treat spiritual gifts like an accessory, not a necessary. I'm going to say that again. I said that many of us treat spiritual gifts like they are an accessory, not a necessity. Paul says, I got to talk to you about this. He says, I got to. Don't miss this. He, 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 says, he says, I got to talk to you about this. He says, you can't afford to be uninformed about this. Watch this. And when he says uninformed or when one, when one writer uses the word ignorance, listen, he's not calling them unintellectual. But he's saying is you either have uh, no information, too little information or the wrong information about this subject. And Paul says, we need to talk about this because I don't Paul's like, I don't know if you know how important this is. And I want to say the same thing to us that, 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 that's watching this teaching right now, whether you're watching it live or whether you're watching it three years later down the road. What Paul said to them, I'm repeating to us, this is not an area we can afford to be uninformed in. Because when it comes to living life as God intended, when it comes to us possessing and accomplishing our purpose, we cannot get purpose right. If we're getting spiritual gifts wrong. Uh, I'm going to say that again. We cannot get purpose right. If we're getting spiritual gifts wrong. Discovering my spiritual gifts. Is key. To deploying my calling. I can't deploy. You know how someone gets deployed. It, right. It, it, uh, the words often used in the context of, of, of military. Right. So it gets deployed. God wants to deploy you and me into the world. We're part of God's kingdom and we're sent to be missionaries here on earth to influence earth with heaven's agenda. And God's like, you can't do that without properly understanding, embracing and unleashing your spiritual gifts. And I am telling you, I'm getting ready. To, I'm getting ready to uh, I, I said I was getting ready to run, but I'm not getting up and running, but I'm getting I'm getting ready to do something. And what many of us have been doing, we've been adding value to the world, adding value to others with some assets that God's given us. Watch this. But many of us have not been you. You, we've been utilizing some assets that God's given us, but not all the assets and the abilities that God's given us. Therefore, you've been making a difference, but you haven't been making your difference. I'm going to say that one more time, that many of us have been helping people using some of the uh, as, uh, assets and abilities that God's given us, but not all of the assets and the abilities that God's given us. And as a result of that, you're making a difference, but you're not making your difference. And making your difference is what determines if you reach your destiny. Did you hear what I just said? 
making your difference. I mean, this is so important that in Matthew chapter seven, Jesus is uh, having a conversation and, and, and he says, listen, he says, not everybody says, Lord, Lord. I don't know if you're familiar with that scripture. He says, but not everybody says, Lord, Lord, be, you know, a part of the kingdom of heaven. He says, people are going to say, well, didn't I like prophesy in your name? And then I perform exorcisms in your name and didn't I help people in your name? He says, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. It's like just because I'm making a difference doesn't mean I'm making my difference, the difference I've been called and created and commissioned to make. And the reason I'm so passionate about this and the the reason I believe this is such a big deal, ladies and gentlemen, is because your fulfillment and your flourishing and your fruitfulness is tied and tethered and connected to your purpose. The acquisition of possessions do not give you long term fulfillment. There's not enough bags in the world to make us happy, not enough shoes in the world to make us happy, not enough cars in the world to make us happy, not enough cribs in the world to make us happy, not enough clothes in the closet to make us happy. Most of us have clothes we rarely wear. You're like you give me a Daniels Den T-shirt. I'm straight. Think about that. It doesn't, you don't go in your closet and smile like, ah, because fulfillment come here is not an outside job, it's an inside job. And I'm trying to, I'm trying to get us to see that I I won't be fulfilled and I won't be flourishing. Ooh, how many want to flourish? Say me, me, me. I want to flourish. I want I want to flourish. I want to flourish emotionally. I want to flourish relationally. I want to flourish spiritually. I want to flourish professionally. I want to flourish financially. And I am telling you, there is no watch this. There is no neutral when it comes to flourishing. You are either improving or declining. Ooh. But somebody put in that chat is up from here. It's up from here. Yeah, can't be fruitful, can't be flourishing, uh, can't be fulfilled, can't be flourishing, can't be fruitful without getting this purpose thing right. And you can't get this right without getting, if you're getting spiritual gifts wrong. Let me, let me unpack this, what I mean, let me unpack what I mean a little more. If, if, are y'all following me? If you feeling me, not just hearing me, but if you're feeling me, just put yes in the chat. I want you to feel my heart. I want you to feel the importance of this. Uh, I, I want you to feel how important this was to God. So God made it important to Paul, how important this is to me, how important this needs to be for us. It's so important to me. My next book is coming out in September. It's on this subject. It's not on the subject of spiritual gifts, but it is on the subject of purpose and how you cannot accomplish your purpose until you understand, embrace, and unleash your unique design. So some people are like, I know what I'm called to do. Not if you don't understand your unique design, you don't. Because some people think just because they're making a difference, they're making their difference. I'm helping people and people are being blessed and I'm opening doors and I'm starting companies and I'm doing this and I'm doing that. And that's great. That's making a difference. And yes, we should make a difference. But what God also wants us to make is our difference. Our difference. Let me ask y'all something. When y'all remember David fought Goliath. When David protected his father's sheep from a lion and a bear. Would y'all say that's a good thing? I would. I'll say it's a really good thing. He's making a difference. Protecting his father's sheep from a lion and a bear. That's a really good thing. It's a big thing. But if that's all he did, he would not have accomplished his purpose. Because protecting his father's sheep from the lion and the bear was making a difference. Defeating Goliath was making his difference. And I'm telling some of you right now who are watching this, your Goliath is waiting. It's time to stop celebrating what happened with the lion and the bears. Let's have appreciation. But it's time to move on from celebrating what happened with the lion and the bear because nothing fails like success. And sometimes success in previous seasons is what keeps us from being fruitful in future seasons because we're so caught up on what we have done that we're not tuned into what we're supposed to be doing.
Come on. So David made a difference, but not his. If you want to know how to make yours, if you want to know how to make yours, I'm trying to push you. Some, some people are making no difference. Other people are making a difference. But then there's this remnant that's making their difference. And if you want to make your difference, put them ready in that chat. All right. So here it is. Here it is. I believe every believer is endowed with three resources. Watch this. Three, three resources that God has arranged and orchestrated that they possess. Everybody has these three things. OK. When I say everybody here, I mean those who have those who have received Jesus as a forgiver of their sin and a leader of their life. This is listen to me. So everybody, everybody in the world has the first two. I'm going to give you three things. Everybody in the world has the first two. But those who share our faith have the last one. Those who share our faith have three. So everybody has what I call natural ability. Some of you heard me teach this before. Natural ability. What's that, Dr. Darius? That's talent. Born with that. Whether people are followers of the person and principles of Jesus or not, they got natural ability. Just things they were born to do. They can just do it. They can just sing. They can, they're just athletic. They're just, you know, they're just, they're just born. So you got natural ability, talent. And some people use their talent to make a difference. That's important. But if you're going to make your difference, you can't just use talent. Here's the second thing everybody has. Everybody has acquired skill. These are some abilities and capabilities that they picked up in certain seasons. Um, based on situations and predicaments they were placed in or opportunities that were in front of them. It means some people were placed in a situation where they had to learn or acquire certain skills to survive, right? Others saw opportunities that were put before them and they knew to take advantage of this opportunity. There are some skills I got to acquire. So there's natural ability, there's acquired skills. But then the third one is what we call spiritual gifts. And you can't make your difference. You can't make your difference. You can't accomplish your assignment without spiritual gifts. See, I, I want to tell you, very often people confuse their assignment. Or <clears throat> they choose their assignment based on their natural ability. I want you to catch them, catch that. I'm not saying that God doesn't give and doesn't use our talent. I'm saying God has given us more than talent and he wants us to use more than talent to accomplish our spiritual gifts. And natural talents are, are not to be confused with spiritual gifts. And I hope I'm making sense here. So let, let me let me let me give you something here. I want to give you a definition of spiritual gifts first. And um, and we're going to come back and try to put the button on some of this here. I'm, I'm just laying a foundation tonight. Everybody say foundation. Just laying a foundation. tonight. So Dr. Darius. You said spiritual gift, I mean, natural ability, that's talent. You said acquired skill is a set of abilities or capabilities that we acquire as a result of situations we were put in or opportunities that were put before us. What's a spiritual gift? Spiritual gifts are special abilities that God gives his people to serve the body and bless the world. These are special abilities that are distributed to us by God. Watch this to serve the body, meaning other believers and to bless the world. I want you to catch this to serve the body. OK, I'm getting ready to show this in Corinth, Corinthians. Other believers cannot be all God's called them to be. Without other believers using their gifts. See, here's the thing. 
I know, I know in there's this theme of independence in culture, right? I don't need anybody. I don't, I don't need anybody. I don't need anybody. It's exciting, but it's inaccurate. <laughs> Did you hear what I just said? It's exciting, but it's inaccurate. So in the world, very often you got two extremes. You got extreme independence where people operate in isolation and just assume incorrectly, I don't need anybody. All right. Then you've got extreme codependence where people are over overly relying on other people that they can't operate and thrive and function independent of the assistance, the, the endorsements and the affirmation of those people. But in the kingdom is not extreme interdependence. Remember kingdom. When I say kingdom, this is what you think King's way. Just put Jesus's way. That's what I want you to think about. Whenever I say, I say kingdom, I want you to think Jesus's way. Right. Because sometimes Christians aren't like Jesus. Got me. OK, so I want you to catch this. So in the in the world, it's extreme independence, extreme codependence in the kingdom. When you live in the king's way, it's interdependence. I don't have extreme independence and I don't have extreme codependence, but there's this healthy recognition that God gave somebody else something he did not give me. And when they properly steward and multiply and unleash what he's given them, it benefits me. So right now, God, one of the spiritual gifts God's given me is the teaching gift. Watch this. So this is my hope and my prayer. My hope and my prayer is when I use my teaching gift, it's adding value to you. Does that make sense? You pray on your own. Yes. You study the Bible on your own. Yes. Yet and still, there are insights and perspective and things of that particular nature that you get as a result of someone else using their teaching gift. Sometimes you're reading the same Bible, same scripture, but God's given that person a teaching gift. So that person has what's called eagle eyes. So they look at the same, like an eagle could like some, some um, have suggested that an eagle can see like a rabbit hiding in the bushel, like a mile away. Like it's just this amazing eyesight. And so God gives his teachers eagle eyes. And it's like, man, we're reading the same Bible and I understand it and I'm applying it. But man, when he explains it or teaches it, I'm like, how you see that in the Bible? Where was that? And some people automatically assume, oh, that's seminary, that's training. No, it's a spiritual gift. But when I use it, people are blessed. One of the things I like is, I mean, I love, man, I love amazing worship. I just love it. It, it, it does something to me. Am I the only one? Like it just, it settles me. It refreshes me. It, it calms me. It reminds me of God's goodness. I'm able to, exp I don't have that gift. I can worship God on my own. Yeah, I can. You don't need, you don't need no, you don't need any music to worship God. You're right. But I do it better when there is. <laughs> you can sing to the Lord yourself. He don't care how you sound. Yeah, but when Tasha Cobbs do it, it just sounds better. So my relationship with God, I remember one time I sent William McDowell a text. I was like, William, bro, I just want to I want to thank you for creating music that helps me get closer to God. Interdependence. That God gave other people gifts that the body needs. Now, watch this. Are y can I challenge you here? This thrive now, this thrive. This thrive, this is not, this is, this is thrive. This is, I'm primarily not exclusively, but I'm primarily assuming, you know, I'm talking to people who want the next level, right? This isn't just a Sunday sermon. You're someone who wants and who recognizes your need for more. So I should be able to, to challenge you. That's how we grow. I want this to be a highly encouraging, highly challenging environment because you can't thrive without challenge, being challenged. Here it is. So you give me permission to challenge you. Here it is. Man, whose growth is being suffered because you're not using your gift?
I, I want that to be, I want you to sit with that for a minute. Because you've just been using talent, which is important, but it only goes so far. You've just been using acquired skill. That's important, but it only goes so far. Your spiritual gifts give you an unteachable, uncommon IQ. Oh, it's just, it's something, it's something, I don't care how many books you read. Your spiritual gifts give you something you can't get in a book. It gives you an intuition and your intuition is the X factor. That intuition where you just know like, hmm, I, I need to say this. I don't need to say this. I need... it comes from spiritual gifts. Interdependence. Listen to what Paul says. I'm, I'm, this, this, I'm going here in 1 Corinthians 12. This is what I want you to see. 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 12, this is what verse 7 says. He might teach an assistant to put this in the chat. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7. He says, now to each one, the manifestation of the spirit is given for the common good. Wait one minute. Paul's here talking about spiritual gifts. And then he unpacks what he means. In verse 8, he says, to one there is given through the spirit a message of wisdom to another a message or word of knowledge by means of the same spirit to another the gift of faith to another gifts of healing to another miraculous powers to another prophecy to another the ability to distinguish between types of spirits to another the ability to speak in different kinds of tongues to another the ability to interpret those tongues. And he says, all these are the work of one and the same spirit. I want you to listen to me. And it says, and he, meaning God, distributes them to each one, that's us, as he determines. Come on here. See, we can pick the skills we learn. If you want to be a better leader, you can pick that skill. Come on. If I want to be a better communicator, I can pick that skill. But I don't pick my spiritual gifts. God distributes my spiritual gifts. But this distribution is based on my design. Dr. Des, what do you mean? Well, let's keep reading. In verse 12, Paul says, just as a body through one has many parts, but all of his many parts form one body. So it is with Christ. We're all baptized by one spirit so as to form one body where the Jews and Gentiles, slave or free. We're all given the one spirit to drink, even so the body is not made up of one part, but of many. Now, if the foot say, listen to this, because I'm not a hand, I, I don't belong to the body. It would it would not for that reason stop being a part of the body. If the ear should say, I'm not an eye, I don't belong to the body. It wouldn't stop being a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? Now, I, So now do you see, imitating somebody else's assignment is not just unwise, it's unbiblical. Did you hear what I just said? Uh, it's un borderline satanically influenced. No matter what the intentions are. So if I, who've been, let's say if I'm called to be an I, metaphorically, in the body, body of Christ. So Paul's using the metaphor of the human body to help people understand what it means to be a part of the body of Christ. And he's saying is like, okay, your, your body has a number of different parts, but all the parts are different. But just because they're different doesn't mean they're deficient. And he's saying that each one of your parts needs to embrace what part it is and operate as that part because it helps the body. So he says, if the rest of your body looked at your eye and said, I want to be an eye. He said, where would the hearing be? Did you hear what I just said? So I want you to, does it make sense now? Tell me if this makes sense. If this makes sense, say yes. That if Satan wants to interfere and disrupt what God is doing in and through the earth, that one of the ways he would do that is to try to get God's people to be somebody other than who God called them to be. Because he knows if the ears don't do their part, the body suffers. And if the hands don't do their part, the body suffers. And if the eyes don't do their part, the body suffers. And I'm going to tell you something. 
I don't, I don't even have time to deal with this. I might have to circle back to this next week. I might be in this series longer than I thought because I hadn't even really got to, <laughs> got to the meat of the message yet. We're just digging. We're doing some foundation. And I think one, there are two things that's, that's coming to my mind that the enemy uses to get us to become clones. There should be no clones in the kingdom. Should other people inspire you? Yes. Should you learn from other people? Yes. Are, are there going to be things that you take from other people and implement into your own life? Absolutely. hundred percent. I have. But what you admire about other people should inspire you to be you, not to be them. Guys, one time I was in a meeting with my team. This was on the, uh, I think this, uh, I don't know if it's, it wasn't my business team, but it's my church. It was two staffs. So anyway. Um, I was in a meeting one time and I said to the team, I said, now listen, God's not called you to be me. He's called you to be you, you, you can't be you if you're trying to be me. Did y'all hear what I just said? So the enemy wants clones in the kingdom. I'm going to tell you something. And here are two things that the enemy uses to create clones. Is this all right? Is this all, is, is this all right? How many feel like some strongholds, some paradigms are being shifted right now? Come on. How many of you, I hope some of you are feeling some healthy conviction right now. You're like, man, the enemy kind of got me tripped up a little bit. I didn't even know I was cloning a little bit. Come on, fam. So here are two things that come to my mind right now that the enemy uses, man, to create clones. One of them is he uses classism. What's that, Dr. Darius? That's what Paul is actually addressing in Corinthians. I'm not even going to bother this, guys. I'm not going to bother this. Corinthian Church of Corinth was a charismatic church. It was. So when I say charismatic, I'm not talking about their energy, their personality, their vivaciousness. I'm talking about charismatic in the sense of charismata, which is a grace gift, spiritual gifts, continuationist. Uh, some of us would call it Pentecostal, right? And there is a distinction, right, between classical Pentecostal expressions of Christianity versus expressions of Christianity that believe in the perpetuity, the, the perpetuation of spiritual gifts. It's like we can believe in the continuation of spiritual gifts and not have some of the expressions of Pentecostalism that we see uh, sometimes in different parts of the world. But anyway, I'm not going to get all into that. That's like Bible you stuff. And so the, the point I'm saying, it, I'm trying to make a point. And, and, and the point is this was a charismatic church that was full of chaos. I'm not even going to, I mean, it was Paul spends thir three chapters talking about spiritual gifts. First Corinthians 12, he talks about gifts. Then 1 Corinthians 13, he talks about how love is greater than y'all gifts. And um, chapter 14, he goes back into talking about gifts. And in all three of these, well, in two, in chapters 12 and 14, he deals with what's called classism. He's like, y'all like taking gifts and you're ranking and putting gifts like higher or more important than the other. And he says some people don't want to play their role because they misunderstand their rank. They feel like less seen means less important. I'm on something now. I feel the witness of the Holy Spirit that I am on something right now. I am telling I'm on I'm, the Holy Spirit is dealing with something right now. He is uprooting something right now. He's removing something right now that a mindset and a perspective and a paradigm that's really a stronghold because there are people who have let other people contribute to them feeling insignificant because they're less seen and Paul says some of the parts of the body that are less seen are most important so right now I'm using my teaching gift got me but the only reason I can get this teaching gift to you is because other people are using their gifts right now I don't know how to make this mic work. I don't know how to make this camera work. So 
you can't benefit from what I'm teaching if you can't hear me. Right? Some of you send me messages all the time about the volume and this and that, right? You can't benefit from what you can't hear. So this part, the people that do this, they aren't seen. But if you feel like they're important, say yes. And many of us are not playing our role. You're not making our difference because it's not significant. I'm on something because you feel like, excuse me, because it's not seen. It's significant. But in your mind, it's not significant because it's not seen. Period. 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 And it's untrue. And some people are not even prospering and thriving. Because they're trying to occupy a role they aren't even called for. I see this so much. It's really scary. And I thought it was just in the church space. It is also in the entrepreneurial space. I see the same trends. Um, it's like, uh, yeah, some trends aren't even church trends. They're just cultural trends that manifest themselves in Christian context, maybe in some distinctive ways. But it is the same thing. It's like in the entrepreneurial space, there is almost like this classism that exists where if you have your own business, you are higher in rank than someone who works for someone else. So it's like people have great and amazing jobs, end up feeling less significant than other people who feel like they have their own business. And it's like they have their own business with no insurance. They have their own business. Not every, right, everything that glitters is not gold. So sometimes you're feeling it's easy to feel. You can feel less than about something that you're actually greater than. Like, I'm a, I got my own business with no insurance. Because <laughs> they got the business, but they can't afford insurance. I got my own business making less than what you're making. They making less, working harder because the average entrepreneur does not work 40 hours a week. So am I saying entrepreneurship is wrong? Of course not. I teach, I mentor, I coach kingdompreneurs. Of, of course, I'm an entrepreneur. But I, I want you to see the point that that classism is not real. And the enemy wants to use that to get people to jump out of their roles. In the business space, I don't know why the Holy Spirit has me on this. I'm telling you, more often than not, there are people who are leaving jobs to create companies when they actually should just be creating companies while they're at their job to create a stream. Like, they, some people are not going to get in the overflow just by creating a company. They're not built that way. They're not wired that way. They're not called to that. Some people are better partnering with other people. But if in my head I got to be the man or I got to be the woman, I'll jump out here by myself and struggle when I could have kept my job, create, that's a stream of income, then launched a business, created another stream of income. Now I'm in overflow as opposed to leaving this lake, which is my job, and now trying to live off a stream. So they were in overflow. Now they, now they out of overflow. They in lack. Am I saying that everybody has to do that? No. Am I saying that there are not times when God calls people to take leaps of faith? Of course they do. Of course they are. I'm just saying the narrative of that. Having my own is better than partnering or working for or working with someone else. It's just not true. It's classism and it shows up in the church. It shows up in people who should be a part of church leadership teams that start their own churches. It's like he should preach. He could start his own church. Leading a church isn't about preaching. You, preaching is the least thing you're going to do. You're only going to do that 40, 45 minutes a week. That's the least thing you're going to do. Is the gospel important? Absolutely. But if all I can do is preach, I need to be a part of a preaching or teaching team. I need more than pastor or shepherding gifting to pass. You need a, we, a person needs a leadership gift. Can I lead? It's 
is this too real? <laughs> Woo. This is like a Daniel's Den session or like one of my uh, transformational coaching or I3 set. Like we, we, we going in a little bit today because this is so important. This is so important. So the enemy uses classism and he uses comparison. He does. Classism, rank, comparison. To try to create clones and to get people to get out of their set place. Come on. And God only equips you for what he's assigned you to. So when I compare and try to be somebody else, God won't help me. The anointing, which is the empowering presence of the Holy Spirit that exponentially increases my impact. Watch this. The anointing only falls on the authentic self. God will only help me be who he's called me to be, not who I want to be. So when I try to be something other than what I've been created to be, there are no spiritual gifts in me that exist for that. This is important, guys. This is so important. I got it's gonna, it's gonna take me a while to get through this series. I see we got a lot of foundational work to do here. I really sense that. But I'm trying to get you to see you gifted. Not just I'm gifted. You might be looking at me like you're gifted. You gifted, Dr. Des. No, I need you to see you. Your life doesn't just change by you seeing me right. You got to see you right. Do you need to see me right? Yeah. I'm not a prophet, but here's the, here's the scripture. Receive a prophet in the name of a prophet. You'll receive a prophet's reward. What's a prophet's reward? Prophecy. You receive how you perceive. Like if somebody's teaching you the word of God, you're like, ah, that's just psst, whatever. Then that affects how you're going to receive. But if there's anticipation, expectation, this is a person that God has gifted and assigned in this area to open up the book to me to help me see things I didn't see before. You'll receive that way. Isn't that what happened with Jesus in Mark 6? Prophet is not without honor except in his own home. Isn't this the carpenter's son? It says he could not do many mighty works there because except for lay his hands on a few sick people and heal them because of the way they saw him. Some saw a carpenter's son. They got the house fixed. Some saw a Christ. They got the life fixed. You perceive how you receive. So, yeah, of course you need to see other people right. I'm saying, though, you need to see you right, too. And you need to see that God's giving you some spiritual gifts. And as we get a little later in this series, I want you to understand what spiritual gifts are first. And some of you, I'm going to have you take or retake a spiritual gifts assessment. Some of you, the, here, here's what some of you, here's, here's what some of you are going to do. And you're impatient and it's going to cause you to be confused. Some of you are about to get ready to run and try to find a spiritual gifts assessment and take it. And all you're going to be is more confused because you don't have a, even if it, See, my, my mentor in business teaches us, don't let what you do know get in the way of what you don't know. So even if you have a understanding of spiritual gifts, doesn't mean you got a right one. So maybe God's trying to reteach you and reestablish your understanding of it first so you can understand it better. So I'm going to encourage you if you're watching this, don't run out and take one right now. Let us recommend one to you that we feel like is credible and um, let us walk you through some, some, some content uh, that will help you understand it properly. But I want you to see that you're gifted. And that it's time for some of us to stop operating. Just with natural ability. Let me just show you real quick how your spiritual gifts work in partnership with your natural ability and your acquired skill. And how when you do not understand, embrace and unleash your spiritual gifts, you underutilize your talent and your acquired skill. So your natural ability and acquired skill go to another level when you use your spiritual gifts. They limit it in how much they can do without your spiritual gifts. Let me give you two examples real quick, okay? So let's say uh, like one of the teams we have at our churches, at our locations, they're called temple teams. And these are people who have the ability to make sure things are right with our facilities and our properties, okay? So, Temple teams. Now, these people can have natural talent to fix things. They can have acquired skill to fix and build things. 
But if they do not have a helps gift, ooh, the gift of helps, if they don't have the helps gift, then they won't be servant hearted enough to be willing to use their natural ability and acquire skill. Did y'all miss what I just said? So it doesn't matter if they got the gifts to do it, but not the gift of helps. That helps gift is like, I can see a need. They see things, other people walk, that helps gift, see, you can't fix something that's broke if you don't see it's broken. And that helps gifts, the gift of helps not only gives you a certain kind of heart, it gives you a certain kind of eyes. You see things that other people miss. It's an, it's an anticipatory anointing. It's this ability to anticipate. It's like, how did you anticipate? How did you know that was about to happen? We need to fix that. That's going to fall apart. Am I making sense there? Does, does, does that make sense? Let me give you another one. Let's take something like um, singing versus worship leading. The ability to sing, natural talent, or acquired skill. Leading worship, spiritual gifts. You can take some of the best singers in the world, put them on a platform on a church on Sunday morning and see how that goes. Because the ability to sing is not the same as the ability to actually lead people in worship. But if you can sing, natural talent, acquires, natural ability, acquired skill, and then you got that gift to actually lead people into an authentic encounter with God, which is what worship leaders should be doing. How much more effective is that going to be? And some of us have just been operating in natural talent and acquired skill because we don't even know what our spiritual gifts are. But God's about to unlock some things in you that are going to, ooh, I felt that. Somebody put in that chat, unlock me. God is going to unlock some things in you that's going to unleash you into a level of effectiveness you never imagined. I'm so glad I, glad I got a revelation on this. These spiritual gifts, I got a revelation on this so early on in my ministry. It changed everything. The skill of communication is something I work on. I have worked on it and I work on that. So that's part of that's a natural talent. It is also an acquired skill, but the ability to take God's word and teach it. That's a spiritual gift. So does that make sense? And it, it unlocked, it launched me into a degree of fulfillment, flourishing and fruitfulness that could not be obtained any other way. You are about to be unlocked and unleashed if you receive that as God's truth for your life, I want you to put in this chat right now. I receive it. I receive it. I'm telling you, some of you right now, this series is for you. Come on. Every series should add value when it comes from the word of God. But there are some words, messages, series that add unique value. Like hopefully all of the teachings bless you, but there are some teachings that's like, Oh, this blessed me in a unique way. God's pushing me here. And that's what God's doing. He's pushing you. He's pushing you. And I want you to receive this push. I am gifted. Whew. Now, God's going to give us revelation all throughout this series. And um, our response is going to be important. So as you receive teachings and things like this, as we unpack what some of these spiritual gifts are and what some of these gifts mean, like I, um, there's a lot of conversation around certain gifts in 1 Corinthians 12 and 14. These are not the only gifts that the Bible talks about. Paul talks about a list of gifts in Romans that I'm going to show you. Uh, Peter talks about 
We receive manifold gifts from God. So there are different places where there are different types of spiritual gifts. And we're going to we're going to use this series to kind of explore and, and, and unlock some of these things and help you understand. Them. But your your response, I'm just telling you, information, information is the first step to transformation. But information should not be confused with transformation. Is what you do with the information that determines. There can't be transformation without information, but you can have information and not transformation. And so the transformation is going to come from your application. You doing and putting in the practice the things that we're teaching. Your transformation is also going to come from your appreciation. What you refuse to value, you benefit. You, you, you cease to benefit from. So this is why I think even things like like, you know, our appreciation through our offering. is important because what are you doing? You are assigning value to God's word. You're not buying a word. Who does that? But you're saying I value this. You're saying I assign resources to things that that to things that do not impact my life like this. God, you're giving me a word. That's actually unlocking me. And when I unleash, when I add my spiritual gifts to my natural ability and acquire skill, everything's about to go up for me. No, God, I want to thank you for this. And I want to sow into my own future by sowing into this word. So each week we give you an opportunity to do that. The giving um, instructions are on the screen. You can go to the website. Um, you can utilize the text feature. We've got different methods to help you remain faithful in this area. And so we want to encourage you to do that. For some of you, this is kind of the well you're drinking from in this season. Um, some of you, we have, yeah, I don't want to get into like my assignment and those that I'm called to reach. But some of you, like this ministry is kind of like this is this is your well that you're drinking from in this season. You're coming from some situations. Church wise has got you questioning even church in general. And right now you kind of locked in in this ministry because you you feel like, OK, this is safe, but you've been burned so bad. You still you side eye me a little bit. But that's OK. It doesn't bother me because I'm called to you. I was born for you, so it, it doesn't bother me. Just say stick with me. You'll see I am who I am. So I'm not even I'm not asking. I've never asked you to rest to trust me. I just say stick with me and then you'll see who I am. But I want to encourage you. I'm not just going to practice what I preach to the best of my ability. I'm going to preach what I practice. I'm going to encourage you to, to say, God, I value this. I'm going to sow into this. Like, I'm not, I'm not, just, I'm not even just going to tip tonight, God. I'm, I'm, I'm sowing. Like, my heart is stirred. Like, I'm, I'm sowing. And I just I feel that for somebody tonight. Whenever you watch this, it could be 3 in the morning. I want you to respond. Say, I'm sowing. I believe God's going to use this to bless your life. Well, listen, this is going to be a, a great game changing series. We're going to dig as deep as we can. We're going to go as far as we can, as fast as we can. Listen, I want to pray a benediction, a final blessing over you. You have not because you ask not. That's the Bible. That's the book you do not have because you do not ask. And so I want to pray a benediction, a final blessing over you. Don't log off until you get this prayer. I'm telling you that right now. Hey, if you're not a part of our text community, we send them reminders that, you know, sometimes you're like, oh, my gosh, Thrive is going on. I forgot. Or Sunday's going on. I forgot. We send them reminders each week. And then we also from time to time, we don't do it often because that's not just and fair to people that are in some of our programs. But my Daniel's Den program, which is my mentoring and coaching program, and I think it is the best faith based. And is, is that bragging? No, it's just me saying what I think about it. I think it is the best faith based development program out there because it covers four areas, spiritual intelligence. We help people get better spiritually, emotional intelligence. We help people increase their emotional intelligence, relational intelligence and their leadership intelligence, all based on principles from the word of God, using as a rubric, the life of Daniel in the Bible. It's the best program and to me, to me. Here's what it is. So from time to time, we drop links 
not often, but we drop links in that text community for people who want to have the opportunity to jump on a coaching call or a group Q and a that I do with people in Daniel's Den. And, and guys, I know we've been promising y'all we've been, we're going to open this up. I don't, I don't think people believe us when we're like, Hey, get in when we open it. Cause you don't know when we're going to open it again, but we are, I promise you, we're working on this. We are going to open it within the next couple of weeks. And so we're hoping by the end of the month, we'll open this up. We got a lot of people on the wait list and uh, we're going to open it up in a couple of weeks. And if you're not on the wait list, go to danielsden.com and get on it because we will notify people in that wait list that is open. Sometimes we take it public. Sometimes we don't. And so we'll send it to people on, on, on that wait list. And we want to encourage you to get on there so that you can take advantage of it. All right, my people, let me pray a benediction over you. Father, I just thank you in advance for all that you're going to do and how you're going to help us unlock and unleash our spiritual gifts. We just commit each and every person to you. And I pray that as a result of this teaching, this series of messages, they would discover, develop, deploy, that they would understand, embrace, and unleash their gifts. In Jesus' name, amen. See you next time, family. Take care. Well, listen, thank you for watching Thrive. I want you to make sure you subscribe to this channel so that you don't miss any of our teachings. And remember, you can watch me live at Thrive every Wednesday at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Take care. I'll see you soon.